So I was looking at your CV earlier. After your bachelor's, you worked at Merrimax and at a um, literary agent. That's right. Um, that sounds, uh, well, that's not something I expected <laughs> from an academic economist necessarily. Uh, can you, so, I'm just curious, like, did you plan on becoming a research economist or? Uh, no. Um, so I can tell you kind of the story about how I got into the field I am in now. Um, well, when I was in when I was an undergrad, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought that if I was going to do a PhD, I thought about maybe economics and maybe philosophy, but I was never. And I studied a little bit of philosophy, a little bit more economics, but I was never so into it, and um, uh, I didn't really have the self confidence to push that forward. But I was a, a, a big, I've always been a big, um, at least in my youth, I was a really big fiction reader. Um, and I was even more so into film. And so when I graduated from undergrad, I said to myself, well, this is the time in my life where, um, you know, I could try things and see if it is right for me. And I had my eye on, on, uh, being a literary agent because that seemed more like the business side of the publishing industry. And that seemed like something that I would be well suited for. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to get that, but I couldn't really get a job right off the bat. But I, I was able to get a job at Miramax first. Um, and so that was really my first job out of undergrad. And, um, I was actually on the marketing and I was in the distribution side. Um, as you can imagine, it was a dysfunctional environment, uh, full of bullying and, uh, uh, kind of, uh, its reputation for being, um, at least from the higher ups, as, as being dysfunctional people and being bullies, uh, and being, you know, um, uh, not an, a a warm and encouraging environment was true. Uh, so, uh, but but after uh, after I left there, I was able to find a job at a literary agency. Um, I shortly found out that that wasn't the right job for me, but it was there when I started reading books about decision-making. As and part of your job or just uh, on the side? On the side. On the side. So reading books about decision-making, and I didn't know that people studied decision-making in the same way that these books kind of were talking about it. And that's when it all clicked, so to speak. I said to myself that I, I don't know that much about this topic, but this speaks to me more than anything else that I've encountered in academia or from an intellectual perspective. I need to study it more. And that's when I applied for a master's degree at the London School of Economics in decision sciences. And that was really the beginning of everything for me. Uh, and you hadn't encountered these kind of books in your... I would imagine like if you study economics and philosophy that... Uh, there would be some overlap with the kind of decision making literature or well or when i was yeah when i was studying economics for some reason i was a little bit more drawn to macroeconomics for instance i uh, you know ma microeconomics which is much more aligned with what i study now uh came pretty easily to me but i was uh, was more intrigued by macroeconomics i was more intrigued by understanding the entire system of the economy as a whole um, similarly, from a philosophy standpoint, I mean, I study kind of ethics now. I wasn't as interested in ethics in undergrad. I was more interested in existentialism and uh, a lot of these more abstract, you know, metaphysics, those types of concepts. But I found the material really, really challenging, you know, and it didn't, it wasn't something that, that, that really fit well with the way I think about the world. Uh, I found it interesting, but a lot of the times I found it interesting because I didn't quite understand it. And I thought to myself, you know, there's some knowledge here that I don't have access to that seems like it's revealing deep truths about the world. Um, and that piqued my interest. 
Um, so I, I, in many ways, I was drawn to things I didn't quite understand, which is good and bad. You know, it's it's um, uh, you're curious about those topics. You kind of want to dig deeper, but it didn't really necessarily fit with um, with ways that I think that you. Uh, well, fit with the way I think about the world. So when I where I did undergrad, they didn't have a big, for instance, analytic philosophy department. It was all you know, there's this analytic and continental divide. Continental yeah, philosophy. You, what exactly yeah. is that dif divide? So uh, continental philosophy is. Um, uh, I mean, it, it dates back to kind of analytic was is more. I would say my my understanding of it, analytic is a much more kind of logic based. Is much more. Uh, trying to understand kind of uh, principles, building arguments in a very structured way, where continental philosophy um, is is more, uh, uh, you know, it, it typically gets associated with like postmodernism, um, which is more, you know, the writers are a lot more. Um, Uh, I, I'm not quite sure kind of how to describe it, but it's a lot more, um, I, I don't want to say fluffy, but that's the, it's not because <laughs> it's not fluffy at all. Um, it's a lot, I guess you could argue it's a lot more, it's more qualitative rather than quantitative. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the way I could describe it, there are going to be other people will do better jobs describing that dis distinction. Uh, but I think that that's, um, you know, that's as good as I'm going to get off the cuff. Yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, you know, uh, if you've heard of, uh, like Foucault, I would say is more of a, um, you know, he's a big name. He, I, I would think he's a big name in more of this continental philosophy, uh, uh, Derrida, um, you know, a group of these, of these postmodern so type thinkers. Yeah, and I would have benefited a lot from a more analytic uh, type of of department in my undergrad. In some ways, I'm glad I didn't do that because I probably I could have seen myself pursuing a PhD in philosophy, which I don't think I would have uh, uh, done well in. So, I'm still uh, uh, maybe last question about literary agency. Um, what exactly does the job of an assistant literary agent entail? Do you just get sent like 20 books a day, and you have to? decide which of those are worthy for further consideration and also what uh, kind of books were was your agency or you handling right so different literary agents in different stages of their career um, will have different ways that they manage their uh, their agency so I was working for the George Borchard literary agency George Borchard was um, or is um, um he was he he was very well established when i joined the agency and so to give you an example one of the first people he signed was Elie Wiesel um who wrote kind of night and is famous for winning i believe two nobel prizes one for peace and one for literature um and um and george bouchard Uh, is French and he moved to America and he kind of got his start representing a lot of French writers in America. All right. So basically 95% of any French writer you could think of that is big enough to be well uh, uh, translated in the United States, he probably represented them. And then he started representing his, his own people. And he is in what they call kind of the literary Uh, uh, more the literary um, fiction and literary nonfiction world. So, what do we? What do I mean by that? These are what you can consider to be. Um, they're not niche books, and that it's not like he's doing cookbooks. It's not like he's doing pop science books, or it's not like he's doing self help books. He's doing very literary representing very literary literary authors, the type of authors who, you know, win uh, Pulitzer Prizes, National Book Awards, and so on. So he had multiple, uh, um, you, you know, every year, 
you know, he may have a couple people nominated for one of those, those prizes. Small family organization, and I just had a variety of tasks that I would do. Sometimes I would read. He wasn't t- accepting um, new manuscripts, so it wasn't like we were reading, you know, 20 b- books a month. But occasionally I would get one to read to see if it was um, – a, a publishable. He wasn't accepting new clients. You know, the more, the younger you are, the more you're accepting new clients, the more you're reading a lot. Um, rather, I, you know, I was, I did a little bit of the accounts. I did, for instance, uh, audio books. You know, I would try to negotiate those contracts, try to get those contracts set, um, and just manage the relationships. Um, the literary agent is really kind of the go between between the writer and the publisher. And so you manage those contracts, you manage the relationships. Uh, very much, uh, 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 you know, in addition to trying to dealing with all the money matters, you're dealing with the relationship matters as well. But how it, it sounds to me like it was, it's a very established, it, it, when you were there, it was a very established literary agency already. So how did you get that with, well, I don't know what you did before, but it seems like you don't have anything that's particularly what I would assume is relevant work experience or, or did you? Right. So the one aspect of my background I left out is yeah, because I knew I wanted to get into the literary world, I took this summer publishing course at Columbia University, kind of a, a short course that's kind of a primer for people who want to get into the publishing industry. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, and then I just sent out uh, kind of my CV, sent out letters to a variety of people. And luckily, he, they needed someone and they responded and everything worked out quite well. You know, it was almost a stroke of luck that I sent them a letter, um, the time that they needed to hire someone. Uh, I see. I see. So, um, and I think because I did that course, they were, that, that was like a signal to, to at least interview me among the other resumes that they had been receiving. And I, I could imagine also that many resumes they would have been receiving would have been more of the literary kind where people studied English or something. But I guess right. from what you described, that is maybe not even what they needed that much, right? Because they weren't, they didn't have to assess lots of new books all the time. Right. I mean, I think that they, you know, having an English background suggests that you're passionate about yeah. uh, the literary world. Um, and, uh, you know, they also, I think, needed someone to do the accounts. And so having an econ background, that <laughs> was uh, uh, something that I could do. Uh, it was a wonderful place to work. Just for instance, because they were so kind of traditional, we we used typewriters to type up all our correspondence. And so, so this was in 2004 to 2006, just for right. context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, back when no one was really using typewriters anymore, that was just like a pure joy. You know, you type up these correspondences and then you wrap up a manuscript, you know. Um, we weren't tying little ribbons on it, but it was almost like that. And Like sealing uh, it with wax. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, so I had, a, I had a great time there, uh, but... But it was also a good experience for me to realize that this is not. Um, uh, I didn't have. I didn't have the let's say the client relationship skills at that time, to to go out on my own and say I'm going to really start uh, my own uh, uh, li- literary agency or literary career. Um, I always felt I was on the outside of the publishing world looking in, and you really need to kind of force your way in to start trying to get clients and represent them. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, it was a great experience and it's a great experience because, you know, it was one of these things that you, you learn not to do. Um, you yeah. try it out and, and I tried out and I realized quickly that that wasn't a long-term career strategy for me. Yeah. I find that's in many cases, almost the most important thing to learn. Right. Like just having those kind of restrictions, like this is what I don't, what I'm not going to do. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. But uh, so then you kind of left just that kind of behind the literary scene, um, or are you still reading lots of novels? Or well, I'm uh, still I I'm still a curious guy, you know. Um, I've as as I think is as I think I mean I, my my lay theory is that this is true. This is a general phenomenon. As, as you get older, you get more interested in nonfiction. Uh, I don't know if. I don't know how general that is, but that's my my intuition. I still read a lot of fiction, but 
and maybe because of what I do now, um, I started reading a lot more nonfiction. And um, there was a period of time, and I think that this is true for a lot of academics, during your PhD, uh, during your young career, you just feel like you don't have time for books. Uh, and, uh, you know, may as well read a paper. And a lot of times, nonfiction books, the introduction or the first few chapters tells you the whole story. And you may as well read a very good paper. Some, um, I would argue that kind of many of the best papers I've read uh, are more informative than many, many books I've read. You know, so it just seems like a waste of time for a lot of people. But a number of years ago, and also you're constantly feeling behind in academia where you just don't feel like you have the time to sit down and read a book. Um, a number of years ago, I decided, you know what? I have more time than I think I have. Um, I don't like feeling constantly behind. I need to make time. And I started reading more and more. And that has just been, in some sense, it's been useful to, one, my self-confidence as an academic. That's something a lot of academics struggle with, uh, kind of imposter syndrome. One, to kind of expand my horizons in topics that I find interesting um, but didn't have that much knowledge about. And it kind of helps you think about, um, well, reading more broadly has helped me think a lot more about um, what are the big narratives that are important out there, or at least that are important and insightful to me, and what do I think is not being addressed by the current field. Um, I don't know how much that has directly impacted the things I actually study, but at least it, it has provided me with a lot of self-confidence. But how self-confidence? Just because you have a broader perspective? Or what, how does the self-confidence play in there? Right. Just uh, because I have a – I think it's because I have a, a deeper perspective on broad topics, you know. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, I feel like I'm th – I feel like I think more about about bigger and deeper topics than kind of the minutia of – the given discipline that you find yourself in. Um, and I have a tendency to kind of go into the minutia and lose the big picture. I think that, you know, you study a problem long enough, you know, you see the details and that can lose track on what are the important big questions that you're evaluating or how do we else, how do we think about, how do other people think about the world differently than they do in your subdiscipline, whatever that might be. Uh, yeah yeah i mean in some sense that's also part of why i'm doing this podcast to give people this kind of insight into different disciplines and how people yeah for example yeah. you as an economist or i mean like, you know i work in uh, large part corporation social interactions and that's a topic that you know okay. half the disciplines basically do at a university right um whether i mean game theory yeah whether it's biology psychology economics computer science whatever right um I mean, then I feel like at some point that can also lead to a bit of an overwhelm because there's a sense of like you have to learn all these different fields. Right. Um, but I, I do also feel that just, tr yeah, reading a, a paper from a different discipline, it's like evolutionary biology or something, just gives you a completely different way of looking at what you're doing yourself. It's a balancing act and you have to find yeah. the balance that really works for you. Ultimately, that's the... Uh, uh, that's what everyone kind of try, you know, I would think ought to try to do. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I wanted to. The reason I emailed you, or the specific reason, is that I read uh, this paper of yours, "Moral Choice When Harming Is Unavoidable." So shall we talk about that? <laughs> I'd be happy to. Um, I think maybe uh, I'm kind of half assuming that the people who are listening to this will have read this paper. Um, that's kind of the assumption, but we'll see. Um, I mean, I think I'm just going to still read, I think, two sentences sure. from your general discussion that I think summarize the thing uh, well, very well. That's probably where you wrote them. Um, so the first sentence is, um, we demonstrated that the preference to avoid inflicting any harm not only is distinct from, but also outweighs the preference to minimize its impact. And then the last paragraph is, We found that decision makers who can completely avoid committing a harmful act frequently choose to do so, 
However, when committing some harm is unavoidable, decision makers become increasingly willing to trade off greater harm for greater benefits. So I think it's really interesting because it seems to me like you're kind of what you found is that people have the almost two different modes of deciding how to think about cost benefit analysis or something like that. That's right. Just to kind of restate that is that, or I kind of put it this another way, people, uh, um, people really want to avoid committing a harmful act. Um, and when they're faced with a decision, should you uh, commit some harm, which will then achieve some benefit or not, they say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to trade off harms for benefit. Uh, but then in situations where both outcomes have some harm t- attached to it, then they're much more willing to say, well, let's conduct, a, let's commit a little bit of harm um, in order to achieve uh, um, a great more deal of benefit. Uh, and so kind of uh, trade-offs that they would they would be very resistant to when they could com- completely avoid committing a harmful act, uh, sometimes become quite desirable when uh, when they cannot avoid committing harm and some harm must be committed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're, when I said this paper is, is a paper that shows an effect, right? There's um, no explanation of like why this exists. It's more like this effect exists. We've tested it in a few different contexts. And... Um, well, we, we, yeah. Yeah, we make the argument that Really, what this is all about is um, is very consistent with with what some other researchers have showed in the past is that people are very reluctant to to commit a harmful act. Okay, uh, and then we argue that 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 is really what's driving this effect. So uh, uh, this reluctant to, to to commit a harmful act um, is very strong, and people are just really hesitant to 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 do that um, and so while people have looked at that angle um, they haven't been able to kind of tease apart well is it that they're reluctant to commit a harmful act or they're reluctant to minimize harm and if they're you know so there's that kind of distinction that hasn't really been uh, separated people talk a lot about harm aversion that people are harm averse um, but what does that actually mean? Does that mean that people want to minimize the impact of the harm that is committed? Or do people want to avoid uh, harm entirely? Uh, you can't tease that apart when you're comparing doing some harm or doing no harm. Um, and so we're able to tease that apart and we're able to say, well, that kind of whatever this notion of harm aversion really just means harm avoidance. You don't want to commit a harmful act. Um uh, and not that you want to minimize its impact. Uh, I feel like that that was a little bit of a confusing way to state uh, the findings, but uh, hopefully the point gets across. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can also so uh, ask, uh, I don't want to get you know, too much about the details of the study because and I think one thing that's really nice about the study is that it's fairly straightforward to understand. I think you have these five or six studies, they're all um, binary choice for the um, for the participants. Um but so I, I guess like one question I kind of have is in a more broader sense is that so you have these different like how do you decide which uh, I mean you, so you I guess so you have this like broader topic of doing harm um, when sometimes you can avoid to do so sometimes you can't depending on what your options are um, so how do you decide to choose like this specific like story context that you use in the different studies? So like, for example, the first one is about putting nice support for someone who's terminally ill. The second one is about donating to a political party you oppose. Uh, and there's three more studies. So like, how exactly do you go about? Right. Um, so we had a number of goals in mind. One is we wanted to use a range of different type of scenarios um, to show that this is in particular about one type of decision that's being made. Um, and so we use we use this range as much as we can to have a completely different types of scenarios. Um, uh, so the, the classic scenario that is used to test these hypotheses is the trolley problem. Kind of the trolley dilemma where um, you could push someone over a footbridge that will kill that person, but then would save 
multiple number of people who would otherwise be run over by a runaway trolley, or you choose not to push that person over the footbridge, in which case you don't commit this harmful act, but you don't save the people as well. Um, uh, there is, There has been uh, some criticisms of the trolley dilemma that it is a little bit too um, kind of abstract, that people don't take it seriously. Uh, so the other kind of classic dilemma that's been looked at, um, and I believe uh, Phil Tetlock uh, is one of the first people to kind of look at this dilemma, is this uh, pulling life support for a terminally ill child. So uh, we adopted that as well, um, and we used that dilemma. Uh, I will say as well that one of the big inspirations about this paper has been uh, problems related to environmentalism, because uh, we talk about a lot about situations where people are faced with decisions in which they cannot uh, avoid committing a harmful act. And I think that that is really true once we realize that so many uh, consumption options all involve committing some amount of harm. And so one example um, I like to use is uh, you know, the food we eat, you know, you could order uh, lunch option A or you could order lunch option B. Well, regardless of what you're ordering, um, there are going to be some carbon emissions associated with A or B. Now, it may be much, much more uh, uh, carbon emissions associated with one option than the other one, but even kind of these low carbon food options, you order a plate of broccoli, it still requires carbon emissions to ship that, to package it, to sell it at the store, you know. Um, and so a lot of the other scenarios we used, we wanted, you know, we wanted to use some sort of environmentally relevant decision. Uh, we didn't use that food example, but we used a lot about kind of cutting down acres of the rainforest um, uh, versus not uh, and uh, uh, so we use that as well. Uh, there are other scenarios that we use that didn't end up making it uh, into the paper. Uh, Why not? Uh, part of it was the review process. Uh, so we had a completely different type of scenario where we wanted to make sure we had one really incentive-compatible design because a lot of these scenarios are very non um, uh, they're hypothetical, and so we wanted to use something that was more consequential. So initially, we so you mean that there's real consequences. There are real consequences. That decisions make. Yeah, yeah so like exactly. Trolley dilemma. You're not going to actually do that, right? Uh, but you can do it with monetary rewards or something. That's right. Okay, yeah. That's right. Yeah, okay. And so initially, we had a scenario where uh, participants uh, could either, in one condition, either steal nothing from an anonymous partner that they've been paired with or steal one cent from them, okay? Um, uh, or we had, a, and then we had another condition, this is simplifying the study, but it gets the point across, where they could steal one cent or two cents, okay? They had to steal something, okay? Um, and uh, the reviewers didn't like kind of some of the language we were using. We, we used the word steal. They didn't, they didn't really like that. And so we had to have another, in, we wanted to have another incentive-compatible design, uh, and so we run this during the election, and we thought, well, uh, uh, maybe we could have people choose between uh, donating money to different political parties, you know, with the idea that donating to the opposition party would be considered a, a harmful act. Um, and if you can't avoid donating to the opposition, would that change uh, uh, how much you'd be willing to donate? Yeah, I like that you actually then incentivize that by saying, what was it? Uh, this yeah, this is actually one of yeah. So you had this raffle, and then if people, in quotation marks, won the raffle, yeah, yeah, yeah. then their their donation to the opposing party would be made. Yeah, um, yeah. I found it funny. So I I looked at your um. So one thing I also like about the studies that you have it's very um open data and all that kind of stuff, and um. So I looked at the uh the, your data set that you have online. And including com optional comments, I believe, by yeah. participants. Uh, and I think my favorite comment was from study two, where someone commented, uh, Bernie 2020, America's only hope for real change, obviously in all caps. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, yeah. And I think 
but what I wanted to get to with the comments was that one thing I found interesting is that I think I, I think this might have also been the case for study two. I can't remember, but I wrote it down for study four, which is the your adaptation of the trolley dilemma, um, that a lot of people commented something like, yeah, but I wouldn't do the harmful act. So what I find interesting is you, you know, you're interested in if people are forced to commit a harmful act or not, how do they behave? But a lot of people said like, yeah, but I wouldn't want to do this. Basically saying like the, the harm avoidance is so strong that most people felt or not most, but many people felt uh, this urge to write that they actually would avoid the harm in the first place. Right. But it's um, interesting. Uh, so the trolley dilemma, we compare people either pushing zero or one person off the bridge or pushing one or two people off the bridge. Uh, and the, the people who had the option between one or two people, a lot of them picked two people, you know, they want to push off two people because they would save that much more people, but that they write, well, I wouldn't do this, you know, which is a little peculiar. Well, if you wouldn't do this, then why are you pushing two people off the bridge? Um, it got me interested in thinking about how if you were given three options, no people, one person, two people with varying um, lives saved in accordance, how would people rank these options? Would they rank, I think a lot of people would rank no people, but then would they rank two people ahead of one or one person ahead of two? Uh, given the, given the, I should say, um, what I don't want to get across is that, um, you know, there's a different amount of lives being saved when you push one person over two people in the scenario that is meaningful. Um, and, and so I don't know how people respond to that. That's kind of one, one open question that is 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 quite well, so you didn't do that in the paper, right? No, we didn't do that in the yeah. paper. Uh, but it's something that it's kind of been in the back of my mind, thinking, well, maybe this is something I ought to follow up on. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any follow ups planned, or I have vague ideas of of, of additional questions to study. Um, that's one of them. How do people rank? Uh, these options and how consistent are they in between ranking the options and choosing between two options. Um, and so, um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure I don't, that hasn't crystallized in my mind yet. The other question I was thinking about uh, 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 earlier today was, um, so I think one question is, one application of this work has to deal with uh, something like technology. Okay. So if we think about a new technology that's introduced, um, let's just say uh, at some point in time, okay, I'm going to take, uh, uh, take a very kind of toy example. Let's just say plastic surgery. Okay. Plastic surgery wasn't a thing or it was being developed. And now let's say there are very good new methods of plastic surgery. Uh, you can imagine some people saying, well, we shouldn't use this at all. You know, people are very reluctant to introduce this new technology because they see kind of, well, if we introduce this, you know, people are going to then change their appearance in ways that, you know, I find objectionable. Uh, and so in the question of should we allow plastic surgery, yes or no, uh, I think a lot of people would say, would say when it was introduced may have said no. Okay. But then you say, well, um, well, what about people who are severely disfigured? They get into a car accident or they have severe burns. Um, and now you say, well, that seems like a reasonable case. Okay. Like an exception almost. Or... An exceptional. And so you, so you say, we'll allow that. And now that that's been allowed, okay, once that's allowed, are they more willing to accept plastic surgery for other cases as well? Okay. And so that's, there's something there that's a little bit synonymous. It's kind of once, uh, once something has been, has been, if you are very anti this new technology, once it is used for something, are you much more willing to use it for other things as well? Uh, so is that the basically the slippery slope? Um, it is a slippery slope type of explanation. I'm not sure if it's been, Framed in uh, uh, the exact same 
way as that I've been doing. Yeah. But that is the kind of same idea, right? It's, it's the same idea. It's much more of a, yeah. And I think that there is a slippery slope aspect to to in some ways I think what we've done can uncover some of the mechanisms behind that slippery slope thinking. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, also when earlier when you mentioned um environmentalism uh, as one like context um that you were interested in, it also occurred to me that it's kind of interesting because I've never I feel like when the discussion is for example whether people should eat meat or not or how much it's never said it's never framed in terms of how much damage you have to cause right it's always in terms of how much you can save so what I find interesting is that actually the way you said it was the first time where I heard the f the framing of not something versus nothing uh, but in your case I heard it as something versus more of something else so that that's just something that just occurred to me then that the framing of just how you talk about these things should probably have a huge effect on how it's then perceived right right and you can imagine um I think that that's kind of a complicated question because our instinct uh, as you say is to f to frame something in terms of um either how much harm can you reduce by choosing one option or the other or you dichotomize it you say well eating meat is environmentally harmful eating everything else is fine you know harmful versus not harmful uh and in some ways that seems like a very nice framing if you want to um enact a change which could then say well i you know cause people to reduce the amount of harm that is caused um but in in another way um you could imagine that kind of obfuscating the obfuscating the reality um and so um a lot of people are very sensitive to certain environmental behaviors that have very little impact you know they don't they don't consider well how much um how much is this actually changing uh how much if we kind of went through and did this behavior you know the classic example of late is uh uh the plastic straws there's been this movement to eliminate plastic straws which yes You know, eliminating plastic straws is better for the environment than not, but it is very insensitive to the amount of good and harm being done. Um, maybe there is, uh, if you're a greater sensitivity to the amount of good and harm and being done, maybe we could focus our attention on other things that would actually have a bigger impact. Let's say by, um, uh, uh, uh flying less or, uh, using more fuel efficient automobiles, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, but it seems to me that um, from what you said, I mean, is that maybe why people are using this kind of framing? Because it seems to me because people are using this framing in terms of, well, if you, you know, do this, then that's bad for the environment versus this other alternative is not bad for the environment. So then you force people basically into, uh, I can't remember what the right terminology is now, but this one way of um thinking whereas if they were to frame it in the other way then people would probably act quite differently based on right so suggestions, right? yeah 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 uh, uh i mean very much thinking in absolutist terms is is typically very good for behavior change any type of behavior it's much more easy to uh to reduce your sugar intake If you eliminate sugar entirely, then you say, well, you know, I'll cut down my sugar in half. Um, and I think it's similarly true for a lot of these moral behaviors. It's much more easy to kind of completely change a behavior, uh, if you're much more absolutist about it. Uh, and so I, I do think that there are some, um, there are some advantages to that absolutist mentality. But I also think that, that there are situations where it can be uh, uh, less than ideal, you know, uh, in thinking about these things. Um, What would be an example? So uh, the example I'm thinking about is, and this is not a perfect example, but um, uh, let, let's just say uh, ordering, ordering items from Amazon. Okay. And so the question is, well, is Amazon – good or bad for the environment. Well, a lot of people's intuition is that Amazon is very bad for the environment um, because uh, they 
ship things in cardboard boxes, okay, uh, and that is unnecessary. If I went to the store, I wouldn't have to buy, I wouldn't have this 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 waste. And so the the mindset is, well, Amazon does harm. Going to the store does not. Uh, but going to the store does do harm. You often have to drive to the store, which we, you know, leases uh, carbon emissions if you're uh, uh, not using, you know, if you're not riding your bike or walking. And a lot of people do do that. And um, Amazon can deliver these things more efficiently. Um, there's a lot of a lot of environmental efficiency gained by centralization, by economies of scale. And so is Amazon good or bad for the environment? That's that's unclear. That's unclear. But I think that the kind of this the tendency to dichotomize these things, you see um well cardboard boxes, it's harmful. Um uh uh therefore it's bad. You know, maybe people have other arguments. Um uh, uh, but that's more of like a a. I think a lot of times this black and white thinking gets you only a piece of the puzzle, and there are much more at stake. That if you encounter, if you kind of map out, well, what are the what are the variety of sources of harms and benefits across these different options? Can we do a better job of of seeing well what is actually more uh, um, appropriate or more uh, morally? Uh, uh, correct in this situation. Uh, it's not a perfect kind of analogy, uh, uh, but um, but but I think it's a I think it's a useful one. I think it's a useful one. Mm -hmm. uh, is is that one you might use in an experiment? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. It's just that's just more top of my, top of the mind to okay. me. Uh, It's more top of the mind uh, uh, to me, and one that I think that people tend to uh, um, see in, in more black and white terms than than is is true of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could imagine also in this specific. I mean, not yeah, as you said, it's just an example. Uh, but in that one, I feel like there's probably also a lot of other concerns about Amazon would start pouring into whatever decision making you have about this one topic. Right. No, that's whether right. It's tax avoidance or whatever, yeah. Right, right. Um uh th that's that's right as well. That's right as well. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a big company, there's a lot going on there. Uh uh and a lot of people have multiple complaints. Um uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um so one question I had about the paper and this is something that I've been so I'm like in my, right now I'm at the end of my second year of my PhD. And I'm at the stage where I already have some results. And the question is, one thing I'm often asking is like, when is a paper ready to be submitted? And when do you kind of need to add another study? Or like, you know, does it need more or less? Or if you have several studies, do you package them as one or as two? So um, you already mentioned one interesting thing, which is you said in the peer review process, it seems like some studies fell out of the thing or something. Um, can you just comment on, so I mean, in this, in this paper, you have, five main studies if i see this correctly and a few supplementary ones um can you just comment on like did you yeah like did you start off with just one and then see where that goes or did you already plan out several in advance or yeah how does how does, did that work yeah so um i i mean so the way i work is um I like to run a lot of studies, a lot of simple studies, and uh, I do it for a variety of reasons. One is I really want to make sure that the effect is robust. I want to rule out some alternate explanations that are top of mind. Um, and then I want to push the effect as far as I can push it. You know, what are the boundary conditions? Um, how can it go one way or the other? That's not the methods that I use is not going to be applicable for everyone. Uh, it depends on the project. It depends on your subfield. What are the norms of the field? What do reviewers kind of like to see? Um, in this project, uh, I have to go back and think. Uh, you know, the, the the other thing about this project is that 
the course of the paper, you change your theorizing as you go along and you write more studies. We actually initially started out with a narrow, a narrower prediction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and we thought that, um, uh, people would be reluctant to commit harm when they could avoid it, but when they can't avoid it, they will commit more harm so long as it provides an efficiency gain relative to, um, and we do find that. Um, but we also find that sometimes they do commit more harm even when there isn't an efficiency gain. Uh, and so we initially didn't have those studies in until uh, Daniela, my co-author, said, you know, I was curious, I ran this without the efficiency gain, and we still find the effect that people are willing to commit more harm when harming is unavoidable. Uh, and so that caused us, well, now we have to design a study to really directly test that. Um, and I always had, so, so most of the studies are just the basic effect. And then we have really two studies that go beyond it. So we have a few studies that demonstrate the basic effect and show robustness. And then we have these two studies that try to go beyond it. One is this efficiency gain versus efficiency loss. Um, and the last one is the one about protected values. I always knew in the back of my mind, as soon as we got started, that we would need to examine protected values. Um, so that was there kind of after we really got started. It was really, you know, the first step is always let's demonstrate this basic effect. Let's make sure the basic effect is there and robust. And then let's try to dig a little deeper. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's really kind of how, how that design went. Uh, but like I said, you know, different researchers have different methods. They have different ways of going about things. Some researchers are very good at just running one or two studies and then getting that published. Uh, but uh, I am just much more neurotic than that. Uh, I really need to, like I can't, it doesn't sit well with me unless I run more studies. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe for, for context, I mean, these are the kind of studies where you can do a quick online study that takes people three minutes or whatever right. to fill in. This isn't some electrophysiology in animals where you right. take like two months to train the animal or something. Like right. That. And we're not running field studies here. These are very simple scenario online studies. Um, uh, and the part of the reason why I do this type of research is so that I can run multiple studies as well and then be more confident about what I'm putting out there into the world. Was that uh, I, ha I've, I haven't read your like earlier papers? It, was that kind of approach something you had early on? Um, because I feel like this kind of I don't exactly know when did you do your PhD? Uh, I um, graduated from two thousand nine to fourteen. Was my PhD? Okay, so online studies were already pretty common or accepted then. I can't. I don't know exactly what. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because that was really the first paper I published was uh, there's was one study that I ran online. That was my first experience with online studies. And so I was really at the birth of that. And uh, I mean, uh, for different researchers, I mean, you should try to expand your methods. You should try to use different types of uh, experimental methods if you're an experimentalist um, uh, as much as possible. Uh, and this is more of a triangulation between you know, the type of research I like to do in terms of methods and also uh, kind of findings as well. You know, um, I do a lot of person perception work. How do we think about others? And that lends itself very well to scenario studies too. Um, and so it's really a marriage between the topics and your, your preferred or what you feel is the best method to study that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I should also do more studies like this. <laughs> well, for it, me, the data data analysis is always the most boring part for me. So it's, oh, I spend too much uh, yeah. time programming right now. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, the, the difficulty is that it seems easier than it really is. You think, yeah, oh, I yeah, could just write a scenario yeah. and have this. But, but it's taken me many years. And even now I make, you know, more mistakes than, uh, than not mistakes, you know, than... Yeah. yeah, I know that's that's one thing when I um 
one thing that I find interesting about this is just how how simple it is uh, as a base. And you know, obviously, don't mean that in a bad way. It's it's just you have these basically five questions more or less that you ask a bunch of people, and then they say yes or no more or less, or option one or option two. Um, well, I would it, yeah, I will say as yeah, well. Go ahead. Yeah, I was meant to say I think it's great that you um, can answer a question with something as basic as that like you know it doesn't you don't have to have this huge study with super complex statistics and whatever sometimes something like this is exactly what you need to address the question part of the reason why i was fascinated by kind of the field of judgment decision making to begin with is exactly that reason it was wow these people are making these really big and convincing claims over these very simple scenario studies, you know, Kahneman and Tversky, you present people with a gamble and then you can make these very, very deep claims about human psychology. Um, but I mean, it's also, it's also, um, rhetorically compelling, you know, the simpler yeah. you can be, the more, um, People will latch on to your finding. Um, it's this. It's this kind of a little bit of a tension between the fear from the experimentalist from the researcher is always like, I don't want to oversimplify this because then people won't think it's that that interesting. Um, but that's, I think, is a much bigger fear than is typically met in reality. Um, and that if you have something interesting. If you have something that you think is interesting, that you're convinced is interesting, simplify, simplify, simplify. That's always better. So you didn't get any criticism that this was too simple or, or something like that, or that you, in the review process or something like that? No. If, uh, and in fact, and I'll read you uh, uh, something from our initial uh, review. Mm -hmm. um, let me just see if I could find it. Uh, uh, I may not be able to find it, but mm -hmm. um, basically in the initial review we got was this notion, this, this, um, this idea that the editor and the associate editor was like, this is one of these simple distinctions that is meaningful. You know, it's a simple distinction that is meaningful. And in some sense, some senses, that's... So you mean the distinction between avoidable harm and unavoidable harm? Right, right. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, in some sense, that's what you want, you know. It's a, it's something that is simple, but still meaningful. Yeah. So what? So one thing that relates to this that I wanted to ask is that... Um, so one kind of, how should we say, general... Uh, let's say conflict almost that I have in my own research is that I'm, I'm really trying to, so I come from psychology, um, but I'm reading a lot of evolution biology or economics or whatever, which is, which, you know, often relies on formal models to make these kind of claims. And one kind of real struggle I have is like to figure out when a formal model is appropriate and when it's uh, maybe unnecessary or something or, or not the, the, Research area isn't ready yet for a formal model or something mm. like that. And the, I was just curious how you thought about this because you, you know, have a background from in economics, which is much more, you know, maths heavy, let's say. Um, but then the study is, I mean, well, not at all that, right? So I was just curious how you, how you think about this, this, yeah, when to use it, when not, or whether you considered using it for this paper or. Right. So even though I have some background in economics, I, um, I've, I very much now consider myself a psychologist, um, and I never really learned to write formal models. Um, and, uh, my kind of view on this is that, um, it, so, so some people, they think better in formal models. You write a model. That's how they understand what's going on. Um, for some people, it's, it's, you know, gibberish to them. Um, um, so one, it depends on kind of the audience you want to reach. Um, and if you can do both, that's great. I don't see any harm in that, uh, particularly if you could do that well. Um, and 
uh, 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 what you think better expresses your idea, um, your theorizing. Um, the, I'm certainly in some of my work, a formal model could be written, uh, but I just don't think I needed that for, for, for the papers. Um, so that's you know, much more, I would say, one of a question of what you believe better expresses your theorizing or idea and uh, to who your audience is. You know, it's a combination of, of both of those. Um, what audience do you want to reach as well? Um, and there is, uh, there is a good amount of psychologists who rely on formal models as well, you know. Um, uh, so I don't have strong opinions as, as, uh, as my way of, uh, of getting to that, yeah. Yeah, I think part of, uh, you answered part of a false assumption I had. So I get, I think also because you're at a business school. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, so I don't really know what a marketing department exactly is or what, what marketing, because, you know, it always sounds like advertising, but I'm sure it's not that. Um, so my assumption was also still that you, um, would consider yourself more an economist or something like that. And that would be more your primary audience. So one of the questions I actually had was also like, why submit this to a psychology journal? But I guess you answered it. You consider yourself right. a psychologist. Yeah. So uh, marketing is this weird department as well um, that there are different, there are different kind of camps in marketing and it's very specialized. Um, um, there are people who are much, much more economics heavy and basically do ec applied economics um, or statistics heavy and they do applied statistics. Um, whereas the, the, the camp that I associate myself is much more psychology uh, or, or psychology and even in some sense, sometimes sociology, sometimes anthropology um, uh, driven as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. The first one of the first things you teach students as they enter the marketing class is the marketing is not advertising. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but why? What is it then? So why? Or why is it? Why is it confused with it? Well, well, marketing we consider to be um, a bar. You know, a simple way to define it is the creation and communication of of a value of consumer value. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, marketing encompasses advertising as one of that. That's the communication of value. Uh, but marketing is also kind of changing your product to meet the needs of consumers. It's, it's as one of, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Oded Konensberg says, it's the interface between the company and the consumer. What is the consumer? So you're trying to figure out what does the consumer want, what do they need, and how can we change our product offerings to meet the needs of those consumers um, in order to create long-term uh, long value. Um, so yeah, it's what, what, is the, what, it, what is the product? Who are we going to target? What do these target customers want in a product? Uh, what price are you going to charge? That's a marketing question as well. Um, not just in terms of um, it, you know, what price can we charge? Um, where do we distribute this product? Uh, we consider this, we consider these questions all to be marketing questions. Um, whereas something like operations is much more about, um, uh, once you've decided or how can you, how do you go about distributing your product? Right. Um, yes, it's tied to where you distribute it to make it more cost effective, but, but marketing is interested in, well, we need to put the product where the consumer shops. We need to figure out that question. Um, mm -hmm. So then how does a paper on moral decision making, <laughs> because this is then very, you know, what most of what you described is fairly applied science, right? Right. Whereas what you're doing here is basic uh, moral cognition or however you might want to call it. Right. So, um, so the way I, 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 the way I kind of associate this with marketing is that um, one, in the easy way is to say that I study consumer ethics, okay? Um, and so it's a question of to what extent uh, are consumers willing to engage in ethical behavior? 
Um, in what situations will they engage in ethical behavior? Uh, how much can we anticipate consumers to engage in this behavior, uh, an ethical or moral behavior? And, um, uh, and so this related to this product project, uh, some people kind of define consumption, you know, any consumption activity you engage with is, um, uh, you could argue has some moral implications to it, um, uh, or at least, you know, uh, some definitions say that consumption is inherently tied to environmental harm, um, uh, at least in the vast majority of cases. And so, uh, so that's the question that I'm I'm interested in. Um, that's my question. I'm also interested in, you know, questions about kind of the market dynamics in, in general. To what extent can we, um, to what extent, extent can we rely on market dim dimensions to create a moral and just world? What are the limits of that? Uh, market interactions, I should say. Um, uh, I would say this paper speaks to that a little bit. Um, you know, in the sense that people, Kind of this more this this kind of when do people think doing more harm is a good thing when it provides this efficiency gain to doing less harm? Uh, yeah, uh, and I think that that relates to our economy very broadly um, and how people see that. Yeah. Yeah. But do you plan on also doing more applied studies in the future about this topic also, or um... we'll see. You never, you know, research is so unpredictable that. First, the, the, the right idea has to come to you, uh, and then you try it and you s see if it works. So I would like to continue in more applied domains related to this work, uh, but who knows if and when I'll actually get there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like this is part of, uh, you know, sometimes you have like one big idea and like, okay, this is like, I'm testing part one of this big idea. Right. Yeah. That's never been my forte. Uh, okay. uh, uh, in some sense, you know, I like exploring too much. Uh, <laughs> I think I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I probably could have published more papers if I, if I took that route, but, uh, uh, yeah, no, I like exploring too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe one thing I was uh, I was also wondering about is that uh, it seems like you're also you know fairly at the forefront of the open science stuff. With in this case, uh, your uh, data was open for all of the experiments. Uh, your materials were all there. Then they were pre-registered, yeah, and they were also, as far as I can tell, well pre-registered. Not the kind of pre-registration <laughs> that sometimes pre-registrations aren't quite as precise as maybe they should be. Um, is that something, uh, so like, again, I, I, assuming that you came from more kind of economics kind of background or something, I feel like this is maybe something that psychology do is doing what probably more than most fields. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I was, I, I would say I was at the forefront of it. But now it's becoming a lot more standard. Now I'm one of many. Yeah. Um, so I was lucky enough when I was doing my PhD, um, I had a lot of exposure to Yuri Simonson, who is one of right. the leaders of this movement. Um, so he wrote that paper on... P-hacking. The... Yeah, false positive psychology. He's written a, a number of papers uh, him and Life Nelson. One of the big ones in the field, yeah. yeah. Yeah, him, Life Nelson, and Joe Simmons. I would argue that they were really the ones that um, spearheaded this revolution. Okay, that was in relation to the BEM article, right? It that wasn't article, that. Was it just it, afterwards? It was around the same time. I don't think they had that article in mind when they wrote that paper, and they did have follow up stuff related to the BEM article, um, but but. It was almost my my memory of it. It was concurrent, um, uh, and Yuri Simonson had been doing some uh, debunking work a few years before then, um, and so 
So I was very lucky to to be exposed to that very early on and really um, uh, try to, to to follow that as much as I could. Um, and over the years, I've just become more and more uh, passionate about uh, uh, engaging in open science, engaging in pre-registration. I am I've I've drunk in the Kool Aid, so to speak, um, and 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 very much I very much think that it's a good thing, and that psychology is is leading the revolution. You know, um, yes, uh, economics had advantages on psychology. They they were much much more transparent with. Uh, their data that psychology was, uh, but uh, I think that they also have a lot of issues that they're not working through as much as psychology is. Um, uh, that's my that's my uh, impression. Uh, I don't know the details there. So so yeah 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 that was a big. I've now have a few published papers that have pre registration um, with it. I try uh, I I upload all my data. Uh, to reviewers, I think that's very important that reviewers have access to data. Um, uh, I want to show, sh- put all my cards on the table. You know, um, I don't see why not. Uh, I think people think that um, that they're at a you know that they're at a dif- disadvantage and that publishing is so hard to begin with that they want kind of they're afraid that if they show a flaw somewhere uh, that reviewers are going to pick up on it. I mean, if that's the case, then you should be, you know, <laughs> one, I kind of trust we've, this is another reason why I run money studies. I want to demonstrate this basic effect is real. It's robust, you know, and if there is a study here or there that doesn't work perfectly, then uh, I'm fine with that. And wherever it gets published, so be it. Um, uh, but now, you know, I just, we just had kind of, one of my flagship conferences that I attend is the Society of Judgment and Decision Making uh, conference, and in that conference, uh, almost everything is pre-registered. That's now the norm. It's an exception if you come across a talk that doesn't have pre-registration involved with it, uh, and so it's just becoming more and more the norm. And uh, and and I'm very happy about that. I'm very happy about that. Is that conference? Organized by the people who do the judgment decision making journal. Uh, well, it, yeah, it's tied. So the judgment decision making journal is is really done by John Barron, although he's kind of passing the torch um, uh, in the process. He's kind of uh, 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 passing that on, um, and he is one of uh, the leaders of the judgment decision making conference. He isn't. Um, I don't think he, I don't think he has that much day-to-day, uh, involvement with the conference or with the organization, but, um, uh, he is, he is one of the, the big names tied to. Yeah. I mean, the reason I was asking is just because that journal is also one of the f- early ones that had registered reports Yeah, and they, I mean, they're very open with their data and their website is the best website ever because it looks like it was designed in 2003, but um, they, they're really, despite the website looking old, they're really on the forefront. It seems of all this stuff. I think you have to have open data and all that kind of stuff to publish there or something. Um, Yeah. I was just curious whether maybe that had an effect on the conference being like that also. I think it's just the the people there are um, just passionate about. Uh, I, I I think it's a it's it's a type of field and a type of conference where um, uh, uh, the, I think actually the open science revolution has actually kind of started with a lot of those members, but has made the community a little bit more cohesive. You know, rather than feeling petty that this other person is publishing more than you, you go to that conference and people really feel um, uh, proud of the work that's being done. Um, and uh, particularly, they like to see good research, you know. Um, and uh, 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 and there's not that much pettiness involved among the researchers just so long as they see something that they like and they appreciate, you know. So, so 
I think the ideals are are uh, people's heart are in the right place, um, and to the extent that I can be associated with that and that feeling, that's something that I would I would love I would love to be associated with. I'm curious about so you mentioned so one slight um one slight problem i see is that so you you said you like to do lots of different small experiments right so i mean do you then report all of them or what do you do with some that maybe didn't make it in the paper like what happens with right so um uh people have different feelings about this uh i have no problem uh, with people having a sizable file drawer Okay, this is kind of the typical file drawer problem. Uh, there are many reasons why I run studies that don't get published. Uh, so one reason is you just didn't design a great study, you know. Um, and a lot of times you design a study and you realize, oh, that wording is very confusing that I've used. Or those DVs aren't really what I'm trying to measure. There are all sorts of reasons why studies end up in file drawers or studies don't work or do work, you know, um, that could end up in the file drawer uh, for any number of reasons. Um, uh, I probably do put my best studies forward, uh, but uh, I'd like to think that uh, they all would or uh, just about every one would, and I wouldn't know which one wouldn't replicate. You know, um, if I feel uneasy about it, particular study not replicating, then, uh, you know, that's a sign that maybe I should run it again, or I should um, think differently. Because now you know that there are these registered reports out there, that if you're doing something that you think is impactful, people will try to replicate what you're doing. So, you know, and my studies are very easy to replicate. Um, it, you know, it takes... Uh, uh, not that much money, not that much time to program it. And so if I'm publishing a study, I want to feel pretty confident that if someone replicates it, it's going to, it's going to work. Um, but where do you draw the boundary? Maybe so let's say you have a study where you, you know, uh, it's just, I'm wondering like, where do you draw the boundary when you say maybe this study wasn't designed properly? Do you decide that then before you look at the results or after you look at the results? <laughs> Oh, because it has a, like say the results are kind of like a bit messy, and then you say, well, maybe it's because of this wording, or like how do you navigate this kind of field of? Yeah, you know. I mean, there are always going to be these judgment calls. Um, you know, I often think that there should be like a um, someone should have a column that's kind of like data ethics, where you write in these kind of questions, like this is what I did, what should I do? You know. Um, uh, so I, I, I tend to think that there are going to be these judgment calls. I think that, you know, the way I think about it is that a lot of times you, it's clear after the fact what was um, confusing or what could have been confusing a lot of times. Or there's another confound that you didn't really think about and you think, well, maybe people are thinking about it this way. Um, you know, these are difficult questions. Um there's no easy answer to them, but what I don't want, um, you can hear my little uh, baby. <laughs> yes. Um, what, what I don't want is for someone to say, well, if you change this wording, your effect goes away and this wording is a better wording. You know, I don't want the effect to be due to a misunderstanding. Um, and it's another reason to post your materials, to post your scenarios, um, so people can see, oh, uh, there doesn't seem to be a confusion here. Or, you know, if you, uh, the, the one reason I like pre-registering, I like posting because it causes you to think more deeply about what you're doing. Um, uh, mm. And I think that that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. but do you, so some of those studies that you haven't published, are those also pre-registered or? Some are, I mean, I have plenty of, um, yeah, lucky enough in this project, almost every study we ran kind of worked. You know, there may have been some that, that didn't quite work or a lot of times really you get like a directional effect and it's just not significant. So you think, well, you know, I need to 
increase my sample size and run this again, or maybe I need to change the wording to make it more clear what's going on. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's some studies, some studies did it work. Uh, they're, 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 you know, I think typically what we try to do is you see like there's these supplemental studies that, um, I wish that people were much more accepting of, of null results. Um, a lot of times you run a study, you get the results and it's something not quite right. And you're kind of pretty embarrassed that you didn't see the confound beforehand, or you didn't see the way things could be, um, differently. So yeah, it's, it's this, these are, these are complicated questions. There often aren't easy answer here. Um, uh, but I think people, you know, if you really are, the problem I typically have is more underconfidence in my effects than overconfidence. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that's going to vary by person. Um, like if I had my way, I would never have submitted any paper I've written because there's always something nagging at me that could be, you know, well, isn't this just due to this, you know, and then you write something, oh, it's not due to that. Well, isn't this just due to this little, you know, um, I think I've now gotten over that, but that was a much bigger problem earlier in my career. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just find it, yeah, I, I mean, like the reason I'm asking this is just because I, you know, like I like the whole, I think pre-registration is um, a great idea when used correctly. Um, and, but yeah, it's just sometimes a bit difficult to navigate exactly. Um, yeah, when do you pre-register something and yeah, do you publish everything or because I think, for example, in, is it an OS? I think so far I've used the, you know, I OSF, the OSF, yeah. with them. So I can't remember like one of the, they're the main one, right? Where, yeah, yeah. I think I've used their standard template, which is also longer than, for example, what you use with as predicted. Um, and I think there they say something that this will be pub or you, I can't remember, but like if you, or was it just for a registered report where you have to say why you didn't publish it? Uh -huh. I can't remember. Uh -huh. I'm a bit confused about the whole thing. There are, there are different camps and uh, with as predicted, you, no, no, you don't have to publish it. Um, and there are good reasons why you wouldn't publish something. Uh, yeah, and I, I, that's where I stand on that decision. I think it's having a file drawer is perfectly acceptable um, uh, because research is a process, you know, research is a process. Uh, and I think for them, the pre-registration is a lot more about, um, s collecting the number of people you say you're going to collect, examining the DVs you say you're going to examine and not about having the full theory ahead of time, you know, about what's going to happen, you know, that they would be in many cases fine with saying, I don't know if this is going to come out this direction or this direction, but this is the sample we're collecting. These are the DVs we're analyzing. This is the Yeah, I found that interesting. So I'd never used as predicted before, but, and I, well, I still haven't, but I, um, when I read your pre-registrations, it, um, I did find it interesting that, for example, for sample size, yeah, they, they said to state it and then in brackets, you don't have to justify it or something like that. Whereas with the OSF, you have to justify basically right. why you. And there's another, there's a, there's another reason for that, which is it's hard to justify sample sizes, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, often impossible, basically. Yeah. I don't know how big this effect is, so I can take and guess, you know, and a lot of times, uh, uh the way I'll run 400 people on this study. Where am I picking that number? I don't know, you know, but um, it's better than 300. It's not as good as 500. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. 500 is better than yeah. 400, but not as good as 600. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, sample size, you know, then you say something like, well, we assume a minimal small effect size of Cohen's D equals 0 0.3 or something, and that's also just basically arbitrary. I, uh, uh, before you study something extensively, uh, uh, I have been wrong about the effect sizes a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.